Hello, and welcome to the Black Magic Treehouse, the podcast where we discuss the books we read as children that, as adults, we barely remember. My Oof. name is Eric. I am full of chicken pot pie. Jose, you're my co-host. What are you full of? Chicken pot, chicken pot, chicken pot pie. Um, I am full of, uh, you know what I'm full of? Uh... Caribbean jerk chicken from a tropical smoothie, tropical cafe. I don't know what it's called. I'm pretty sure it's tropical smoothie cafe, uh, which I've had before. But for some reason, the one I had today was spicy on an ungodly level. So I'm full of acid reflux and mm. um, and uh, you know some tums to to keep that at bay. So I think that is Christmas cheer, though. Tum, 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 tum. Yeah, I think that is Christmas cheer. I think that's the chemical. Do you remember those now. commercials? I do. I do remember those commercials. It's. I thought that they were like magical products because of those commercials. <laughs> I did because I didn't know what acid reflux was. So every commercial would just be about somebody being like, "Go ahead, have the cheesecake, have the jerk chicken, have the whatever," you know. So I was like, "Oh, they just negate all the bad health effects of any food ever." Yeah. What a miracle product. <laughs> With a catchy jingle. This is truly a wonderful time to be alive. And then there was also the old AT&T commercials, which bothered me because it was like dial, you know, dial double zero or whatever. And then the, the jingle was, um, oh, oh, it's magic. And it always annoyed me because I was like, in the song, isn't it? Oh, 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 it's magic. So they cut off an O. And I didn't like that. It didn't sit well with me. See, now I don't know if that's actually true. Oh, oh, it's... Ma- I feel like it's two. I think we have a Mandela effect going on here. <laughs> How many OOs come before It's Magic? Yeah, well, we'll never know, I guess. Yeah, I feel like something similar happened to me, where for a time in my life, I thought the song truly did go... You're crumb believable. Go, go. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I feel like this has come up before. <laughs> really? Oh my God. If it has, it has been decades, <laughs> which really says about something about how much things have changed, but also how much things are exactly the same as they were <laughs> when I talked about that last. Oh my God. Hey, speaking of OO, oh, oh. we're going to be talking about some books about school OO Whoa. with the Bailey School <laughs> oh, Kids. Man. I saw the stretch marks on that one. <laughs> oh, oh. Wow. Well, bravo. It was a rotund bit of joke. Yeah, bravo, though. You know, A for effort for sure. Uh, you could say. I know you like to. Uh, explain the premise of this podcast every single time so do you feel like you need more preamp before we just get into the books we're going to talk about hey guess what folks this is the podcast where we talk about the creepy books you read as Uh, i didn't know it was actually to do it yeah well guess what guess what gauntlet thrown gauntlet picked up so (laughs) here you are sir you dropped this and as i was saying this is the podcast where we talk about creepy books written for kids that we read as creepy kids back in the day and uh as or not or or not yeah that is true as in the case of today's subject which as eric so beautifully described to us it is a double o <laughs> bailey school kids special uh we might it's even called call it it's called a segue yeah that it's us it's a segue that it, that it was segue you ride right off the cliff yep. just like that uh ceo guy mm-hmm. quality notwithstanding it was a segue um and we, i guess we could call this the the holiday special or the winter edition at the very least because um you might know this dear listener if you were an avid fan of this series um, but there are, and my wife actually checked this today cause I'm like, there are like 70 of those books. And she looked on her phone and she's like 80. <laughs> oh, sorry. 80. There are 80 Bailey school kid books. 
Um, which, you know, when you compare it to the subject of our last episode, Goosebumps, is uh, certainly a modest number, but, you know, it's uh, that's still a pretty hefty amount of books to reckon with, especially books that, for all, um, all intent and purposes, are pretty much the exact same thing, <laughs> book in and book out, because we're dealing with the same cast of characters. This is not an anthology series like Goosebumps. Same cast of characters, these four elementary-aged kids uh, let's see if I can remember their names without looking at the books. There's Eddie, of course. Everybody knows Eddie. The jerk, the prankster, the goofball. Uh, there's Howie, who is the more sensible boy. He wants to grow up to be a doctor, so he's a little bit more considerate and learned uh, in his approach to life. There's Marsha, who kind of strikes me as, like, the spunky girl. Maybe Marsha? There's no Marsha. Marsha? Who is it? You mean Melody? Melody, Melody. There it is. Marsha. You know. Marsha's her sister. I, I don't no think idea. that's she true. She doesn't have a sister. No, it's not true. But you, you can just admit you just Marcia... watched a very Brady Christmas. No, uh, Marsha's the name of one of the authors, uh, Bailey School Kids. There's Debbie Oh, Bailey. true. And Marsha Thornton Jones. So guess what? I was still on Bran. So booyah. Everybody who thought I was an idiot just now, mostly Eric. Yep, he's raising his hand. He's admitting to you, it. It's the first what's step. Melody's whole thing? Because I, I still don't really. I Eddie and Howie are pretty easy to tell apart because Eddie is consistently displaying his character trait. Yeah. <laughs> And I think it mentions at least once per book that Howie wants to grow up to be a doctor. So he's always nagging people about like, uh, you know, don't smoke, Eddie. That's bad for you. <laughs> yeah, because that was something that happened in a book. Eddie, the the nicotine fiend. Um, yeah, Eddie, Eddie makes his personality known like literally with every line of dialogue. Um, so depending on your temperance for that kind of thing, it can either be like, marginally endearing or just abysmal um so yeah we got our two boys melody like i was saying i feel like she's the spunky gal uh, maybe if i read more books from the series um it would it would maybe be apparent like is she possibly like a tomboy does she like to play sports things like that i didn't really get a grasp of that from the the handful that i did read but she seems to be the more adventurous one the kind of go getter she in a lot of ways seems to be the natural leader of the group um cuz it seems like she's always the one who wants to investigate and get to the bottom of whatever mystery is going on um and then there's Liza, Liza, <laughs> Liza. She, um, she seems I don't think to be there's, the fretter. Um, I don't think there's any precedent for that name being pronounced Liza. <laughs> uh, Lizzo. So I don't know. I feel yeah, like... spelled differently than L I Z A. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Okay, here we here we go with names again. I f the reason I said that is because I thought to myself. Why would it be Liza? Nobody says Elizabeth. It's Elizabeth. So why wouldn't it be Liza? It's just That's one of those weird really names. a complaint to take up with somebody who is <laughs> on a different Named Elizabeth. Podcast, I think. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Is um, Liza anyhow. always short for Elizabeth? Elizabeth has too many nicknames. Because you yeah, could be it's a one Liz of those... and you could be a yeah. Beth. So is Liza Minnelli's name Elizabeth Minnelli? Yeah. I'm going to look it up. Yeah. Liza Minnelli. <laughs> uh, it, I would think that the majority of um, people who uh, who use that name probably prefer not to go by Liza because it sounds like lizard. Um, I mean, according to the know. Wikipedia page, it's, it's just Liza. Liza May Minnelli. So... Boy, how I think did we you're get kind here? of a wrong person. I'm. I, I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure I am. Liza is the scaredy cat. I think is the short way mm -hmm. of saying her archetype. Yeah, she's the Luigi to um, <laughs> Melody's Mario. There you go. 
Very much so. Um, so yeah, those are our four friends, our four kids who take us through these many, many adventures of the Bailey School Kids throughout the course of these 80 Yeah, books. and if anybody, because I only had a, um, the word is not tenden- tangential, but peripheral uh, yeah awareness of the of these books when i was a kid so for anybody who doesn't remember by the title the bailey school kids this is the one with um titles like you know elvis doesn't wash your car or whatever uh <laughs> you know gremlins don't do planks um uh, <laughs> i just felt like a shot of creative adrenaline where I now want to just come up with f- five dozen make believe <laughs> Bailey School Kid titles and updated just ha- for today's kids. Yes, and just have a time with it. <laughs> somebody must have beat us to the punch with that. I- I'm sure that somebody has compiled a list of um <laughs> of updated. Bigfoot bit. doesn't parkour. <laughs> that's up to date as of 20 years ago yeah exactly we we say up to date by that we mean things that happened at least 10 years ago um because that's how that's how tapped into modern culture we are here on this show i mean what can you expect we're talking about things that are 30 plus years old you can't expect our perspective of modern society to be that uh that's shiny and new. Um, well, I think about yeah. that a lot because um, I, I'm kind of immune to those things. You know, like you see those memes floating around, like want to feel old, uh, you know, such and <laughs> such is celebrating its 20th anniversary or whatever. Um, I'm immune to those things. But what does really get me is thinking about the difference between like, like uh, I'll tell you why I'm thinking about this because there's a movie called man of the house. Well, there's two movies called man of the house. One is from 1995 and stars Jonathan Taylor Thomas and Chevy Chase, which I saw when I was a kid. And then an infinite amount of time later, in my memory, they made another movie called Man of the House with Tommy Lee Jones, where he's like a a Texas Ranger who has to defend uh, or look after these cheerleaders who witness a murder or something. And in my head, I was like, oh, reusing the title Man of the House. And uh, Jose's yawning at my really exciting analogy here <laughs> so no i'm just old and but, a dad and it's 10 o'clock at night yeah but uh anyway my point was that in my memory there was so much time between what the both man of the houses because i was a kid with one and adult adult when the other one came out but then the second man of the house only came out in 2005 that was only 10 years between the two man's men of the house. Mm. And so in my head, it's like that 10 years feels longer than the time from 2005 to right now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> so that's the kind of stuff that yeah. gets to me is like thinking about like, like um somebody once posted, like, you know, it's been, and this was a few years ago. It was like, um it's uh, more time has passed from between the end of that 70s show to now then passed between the actual 70s and that 70s show. That's grim. <laughs> that's some grim stuff right there. Yeah. Yeah, that's the stuff that that's the stuff that really gets to me. But speaking <laughs> of 2005, I'm not sure how many more of these books came out after cuz we both read Abominable Snow, The Abominable Snowman Doesn't Roast Marshmallows, and that one was published in 2005, which was honestly later than I was expecting. I didn't realize these yeah, books were going that late. Yeah, especially, oh well, it was 2005. And it's it's nowhere, it's not the final book in the series or anything. Well, it's the final so, one in like... I don't know when they actually stopped. Yeah, I think it's the final one in the OG series, you know, in the sense that um, like uh, Goosebumps had 62, I think they went up to 50 with the adventures of the Bailey school kids. And then that's when either after, I honestly don't know the publishing history either afterward or, you know, kind of like with goosebumps, it was like simultaneous maybe uh, towards the end of that run. They had the, they had a couple of spinoff series. There was the super specials. They did six of those. There was a spinoff series called the Bailey City Monsters. There was 10 of those. And then they had one, two, three, four, five holiday specials. 
Um, so yeah, I don't know if those were being written and published in conjunction with like the latter entries and the OG adventures of the Bailey uh, school kids series, or if one came after the other, you know, like, um, consecutively, uh, I don't know. And honestly, I, I don't have the energy to look it up. Um, just know that they are out there and they made that many books. I don't know. And I don't yep. care. Yeah. Well, one of the, I had some notes about the ones that we actually read ah. and the note that I put under, uh, general thoughts hmm. for the whole series was I'll read it verbatim. Cause you guys, you guys deserve a peek behind the curtain into my genius mind. Hmm. I wrote, considering how light the books are, they had a pretty slow publication schedule parentheses, parentheses, usually one or two a year maxed out in 1995 with seven books published. Mr. Stein, they were not. <laughs> well, as previously discussed on the last episode, um, don't know that <laughs> Ms. Davey... Yeah, Mr. And... Stein might also have not been Mr. Stein. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It seems like um, Dady and Jones were uh, working close together to produce these. And um, I think it's at the end of The Abominable Snowman yeah, uh, at the end of the Abominable Snowman book, I think they had a bio, an author bio, and um, I like some of the other entries that I read from this series, but this one has like a nice little picture of them together. Um, it says, Debbie Dady and Marsha Thornton Jones have fun writing stories together. When they both worked at an elementary school in Lexington, Kentucky, Debbie was a school librarian, woot woot, and Marsha was a teacher, also woot woot. Woot Woots were mine. During their lunch break in the school cafeteria, they came up with the idea of the Bailey School Kids. Debbie and her family now live in Fort Collins, Colorado. Hey, is that close to where you are? Woot Woot for me. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. That's, I live in Colorado Springs. Fort Collins, where my sister and parents live, is, yeah, two hours north. So hey. if she's still there, I guess I should make the pilgrimage and get her on the podcast. Yeah, right. Debbie Dady, let's make it happen. And Marsha and her husband still live in Kentucky, where she continues to teach. Uh, and this was the line that I mainly wanted to get at. It says, how do these authors write together? They talk on the phone and use computers and fax machines. Learn more about Deb Debbie and Marsha at their website, www.baileykids.com. I wonder if that's still active. Let's see. But, uh, yeah, what I was mainly getting at was, um, yeah, here were two authors that were separated across the country. And um, that could that could possibly be why the production on the books was a bit slower, perhaps, than, say, others of its kind. Um because it was not only two authors working in conjunction to produce, you know, like a single entry, a single title from the series, but they had to do it in like not real time. So maybe that's why. And I'm just getting the spinny wheel of death for baileykids.com. So I'm guessing it's no longer active. That may be a fun little way back machine trip to make at a later time. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Let's get that we on also, our Insta. Well, I, th I guess we should go buy fax machines since we live across the country from each other. And then yeah. we could write some books. Or we could record the podcast with fax machines. <laughs> how we'd would that game, work? We'd be game changers. That's how that would work. Nobody will see oh. that coming. It's a, it's a medium that hasn't been cracked into yet. We'll be the first right. and the last. <laughs> uh, well, I did not read these books when I was a kid. I think mm. I read one. We had, we owned Pirates Don't Wear Pink Sunglasses, I remember. That one was in my, my sister's room uh, had, I'm blanking on what the term would be. Um, it was not a dresser. It, it was like an entertainment center, kind of. Okay, like sure. Like with... Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, but she had like her a cache of books in there that I don't know why these were all in her room because they were books we both read. She had like all the all the true life ghost story books, like the Alan Zulo or mm -hmm. Zuyo or whoever he is. Uh, well, as you, you previously know. established, um, she was the favorite, so I guess that's why she got to keep all the books. Yeah, and she had a bigger room too. 
Oh, uh, man. And she got to cut her own like, birthday cake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> man. Uh, and, um, yeah, anyway, Garfield and Farsight and stuff. But she had hmm. Pirate Somewhere pink sunglasses in there. And I'm pretty sure I read it, but I could not tell you anything about it except that the cover was a pirate wearing pink sunglasses. Uh, but I didn't read these. Anyway, the reason I say all that is to say that I realized as I opened up the first book and started reading, um, I realized that I had always assumed, even though this makes no sense, that these kids were all related, like they were all brothers and sisters. Hmm. Yeah. And then as, as soon as I read like Bailey's school, I was like, oh, right, school kids. They're all schoolmates together. Why did I? And also, you know, they're not all white. So I don't know why I was assuming that they're all, and they're all the same age too. I guess I just, <laughs> in my head was just like, you know, the boxcar children. It's like, they're all <laughs> kids, family members or whatever in every book series about a, a grouping of kids. Cause why else would you hang out with anybody? <laughs> yes. Surely you wouldn't make friends and, establish social connections with people you only marginally knew from one sector of your life that would be that would be the true horror story not vampires sipping lemonade or whatever it is that they don't do that they actually do do um but yeah i had a did you yeah i was just yeah i was going to say i i did not read these books um and if i did it must have only been one uh cuz i have no memory of it um and I can't even say with real certainty if, you know, at the time uh, that I was a Bailey school kid myself in elementary school, I can't say with any real certainty if they were even in my periphery or not. There's just like that faint kin kindling of memory that um, comes about when I hear the titles like, oh, yeah. Uh, kind of like you said um, when you in, when you introduced the series just now, like oh, if you don't recognize it by you know the t the series title proper, the Adventure of the Bailey School Kids, these are the books that go by, you know, aliens don't wear boxer shorts, blah blah blah. Um, the Jersey Devils not on TikTok, <laughs> or is he? Um, he's a massive influencer. Who would have known? Um, yeah, we're going to Oh boy. Yeah, we're going to have to we're going to have to like come up with some and report back in the next episode. So, hey, what are your Bailey school <laughs> titles for this episode? Anywho, um yeah, I feel like it's kind of similar to uh I don't know why, but I it makes me think of friends, you know, with the episode titles. It's like, "Oh, the one with." <laughs> so, it's like, "Oh, this is the one where Abominable Snowman doesn't roast marshmallows. That one really is a title and is the title of one of the books that was read for today's episode. Because as we said, um, since this series is so, you know, relatively massive, it's like, well, where do you start? Um, what do you use to kind of hone your focus? So since it is the Yule season, Eric and I decided to hone our sights on the books that dealt with uh christmas and or winter and or holidays and or that's it that's 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 all that we use to hone our focus on um somewhat embarrassingly uh i discovered only today the day of this recording that there were like three other books from the series that i had on my shelf um that actually take place either in the winter or on or you have to do with christmas <laughs> and I, I initially i was like oh just the, the they have these two santa claus books clearly those are the one or the, the two and only christmas entries in this whole entire series meanwhile there were like three sitting on my shelf just being neglected so I feel a little silly about that but you know i uh i feel like based on just and what the, are those titles because you hit me with those before those we titles? started recording so the ones that Eric and I actually read for the recording of this episode were the Santa Claus books, the first of which is number three, and that is Santa Claus Doesn't Mop Floors, uh, number 50, so all the way to the tail end of the original series, number 50, The Abominable Snowman Doesn't Roast Marshmallows, 
And you said you read the Mrs. Claus one, Eric? Yeah, Mrs. Claus doesn't climb telephone poles. And that was one of the holiday specials. Uh, so I thought we had covered, we had our ground fully covered just amongst those three books. But lo and behold, there were three books that were just ripe for the picking that totally went right over my head. Uh, so let's see if I can do these in order. So number 17 is Elves Don't Wear Hard Hats. And when uh, my wife initially told me about, oh, yeah, the elf book, I'm like, oh, well, no, that's not a Christmas one. I mean, elves, just because just it's elves doesn't mean it's like Santa's workshop elves. It could be like, you know, elvish people like from Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. And she's like, no, no, it has to do with Christmas. And I took the book down when I got home and, oh, look, there's the tagline. Bailey City needs a little Christmas magic. Yep. OK, I was wrong. They are Santa workshop elves. So that was number 17. Number 28 is the unicorns don't give sleigh rides, which is, in fact, a Christmas one. You see the kids all aboard a little Christmas sleigh and there's a unicorn prancing in the background and uh, Eddie is looking devilish as always about to lob a snowball at somebody and then number 33 uh, I think this I don't think this one was um, a Christmas episode but it's giants don't go snowboarding and the tagline to that one is he's one big boarder dude (laughs) which you know is pretty straightforward as these things go. Yeah. Well, I did note that there were a number of holiday specials, but um, I feel like most of them, except for the Mrs. Claus ones were not specifically holiday themed. Oh yeah. Hmm. Let me look it up. Cause I, well, one of them is aliens don't carve jack-o'-lanterns, which oh, you know, I least, guess that's a holiday. At least sounds, sounds pretty close. Oh, okay, I see, I see. Maybe I just wasn't thinking about any other holidays besides December holidays. So there's Swamp Monsters okay. Don't Chase Wild Turkeys. Mm. Aliens Don't Carve Jack Lanterns. Mrs. Claus Doesn't Climb Telephone Poles. Leprechauns Don't Play Fetch. And Ogres Don't Hunt Easter Eggs. That's all. That's all, folks. Anyway, that was all I had to say. Was it? Yeah. So, where do we want to start, Eric? Do we want to start with number three? Santa Claus doesn't mop floors. Um. Well, let me ask you this, because my having not read these books, as far as I can remember, anyway, until now, my preconception was that it was going to be proven by the end that Mm. the entity that they thought was, you know, a Halloween monster or whatever. Like I thought they were going to find out the, at the end, like, Oh, we just got carried away in our imaginations. It was all just misunderstandings. Um, I don't know if you had that thought or not, but that's not really how the books turn out. I, Hmm. I don't know that I had that preconception or not um and i thought it was all going to get like explained away scooby-doo style you know yeah and i feel like this question is jostling some dormant uh memories even though i just said earlier that yeah i don't think i really encountered this series at all or thought about it when i was in elementary school but now i'm wondering if I did, and if I did have that um, that perception that it's like, oh, well, they're not really monsters, I don't want anything to do with that because, as we previously discussed, I was just firmly entrenched in, like, supernatural goings-on and goopy monsters, and, you know, if it was anything that was just, like, being cute about it, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. So now I'm wondering if it was more a case of not being ignorant, but being um, specifically uh, rejecting the series and all that it stood for as a, as a pious little (laughs) monster kid in elementary school. Um, So yeah, that, that might've been the case. 
Yeah, no, I think I was the same way. But you know what I read, though, in, in my research for this episode, hey, hey. my extensive research, um, I read that the, uh, you know, what's her name? Double D on Twitter <laughs> confirmed Dady. that, like, uh, yeah, yeah. she Somebody asked her on Twitter, um, I don't know, something. And <laughs> she, she said, um, originally our plan with the first book, which is uh, called Vampires Don't Wear Polka Dots, um, she said originally we wrote an ending that confirmed that the teacher, because she might be the only title character who's actually recurring throughout the series because she crops up in, or at least is mentioned in later books. And I forgot her name. Do you remember her name? Right. Mrs. Uh, Doodle. Ms. What? Jeepers. Mrs. Jeepers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ms. Jeepers. Yeah. Apparently, we didn't read the first book, but apparently the vampire that doesn't wear polka dots is her. Anyway, anyway, the author said on Twitter, um, our original draft did specify that she actually was a vampire at the end, but then the editor hmm. thought that would be too scary, so we had to keep it ambiguous. So that became the formula for the whole series. Wow. Well, it does make sense. I don't know. And see, I'd be interested to know that aspect of it, you know, that the editor came back and said it was too scary. So it's like, who was like the audience that these books were initially made for um because yeah when you look at them they're certainly shorter than say a goosebumps book um the type is uh is large which maybe um hints that uh it was you know maybe for perhaps emergent readers like basically a beginner chapter book series say for potentially first grade second grade students thereabouts um and it includes the the books include illustrations interior illustrations um and the chapters themselves are are much shorter and punchier than something that you might see again to beat a dead horse in a goosebumps book so um yeah i guess i'd just be curious like who who you know what what age range were they uh did they specifically have in mind when they were making this i guess i mean i kind of put it together myself but i'd like to hear it from the lips of the creators themselves yeah but the funny thing is that even though the books end on an ambiguous note you know as far as the letter of things i would say they kind of don't really end ambiguously on a like spiritually speaking because yeah none of the stuff that the kids see or hear that leads them to think that the kids are monsters ever gets refuted at all mm -hmm. like it's just sort of like Oh, well, now that's over. The end. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I think um maybe it was a different case with uh, you know, the first book where it was a vampire specifically. Um just because the nature of the vampire is to you, you know, specifically prey on living people and drain their blood, so maybe that was why they felt a little shy about it. Uh, you know, compared to say something like elves or even ogres, um, that that might those those um or unicorns, you know, those fantastical creatures might not have warranted that kind of um squeamishness uh, on the part of the creative team, um, but I think in a way the amb the ambiguity is scarier, um, on you know overall um you know maybe with a vampire specifically not so much it's like oh well you know maybe she is just kind of like an an eccentric lady <laughs> who you know comes from an eastern european country and you know uh, has a little bit of a malevolent glare um uh, that makes me sleep a little easier at night but once you get like 20 books in and you know these are all adult figures they're they're, they're not like fellow kids um that uh, these students are encountering they're all adults that are either I, I you know we we only read a handful of books so it i think it seems like the majority of them are just uh as i said before we started recording weird transients who are just passing through bailey city uh for you know their little time in the sun before they move on um you know they the majority of them don't seem like they're ms jeepers where uh they actually become full-time residents um 
but but still i mean it even if these people weren't like uh taking you know uh setting up house in bailey city forever i still feel like even with them just kind of passing through and moving on (laughs) you know when you get like 20 books in it creates this very uneasy feeling of like oh my god are, are you know are are they or aren't they and this keeps happening to us like it's a it's a cast of recurring characters and they keep running in to these weird people who may or may not be fantastical creatures um i don't, I don't know what what do you think about that uh yeah you're right oh okay That's what great I think about that yeah perfect Let's just... and it's also and two out of the four books that i read were kind of like quasi sequels because obviously mm-hmm. mrs claus doesn't i was curious actually if they were going to keep the continuity of having mrs claus be cut like you know sometimes if a series goes long enough they'll just kind of forget about what happened early on so i was like are they going to remember santa claus um and it yes it do, it turns out that she does talk about you know sc to um eli the elf who also turns up in hey. santa claus as a mop floors so it is a direct sequel and then in the uh, abominable snowman doesn't roast marshmallows he refers to his cousin uh squash yes who apparently was in an earlier book who is you know sass squatch or you know a guy uh uh oh, it was the guy who taught them square dancing, I think yep. was the backstory, who had really gigantic feet. <laughs> <laughs> and he uh, and uh, the abominable snowman is like, I'm here to visit my cousin. I think I said that already, but yeah. So it is kind of like monsters beget monsters. Like when it's like the more they pass, the more that pass through, the more doomed you are to encounter more afterwards because yeah. they're all bringing each other there. Yeah. Um I mean uh if we're in if we're talking about general impressions um what what is your kind of um overall f- feeling having read just a few of them and having a a sense of this the series and kind of its uh its formula basically um just just what are your thoughts about uh, how it all works like do you, do you think that this would have been a series that appealed to you as a kid do you i mean clearly it um a lot of people do remember it um so it, it you know my wife is one of them <laughs> the reason that i have as many on the shelf as i do is you know not just for this podcast because we cover you know stuff like this but she was actually an avid fan of uh this series and she's reread every single one that i've brought home um so it, it it's it's interesting to me um basically what you know what did people see in this series um just being somebody who was not there on on the ground level uh reading them when they initially came out well did she give you any notes to pass on about her own affection and where that stems from she so it seems to me like when i asked her and i did ask her about this a while ago because um i was actually hoping to get her on the show to talk about them um but she's a little shy when it comes to those things um she i I asked her like so what what can you tell me about this series like and this was after she had reread a good amount of the ones that i brought home like what what can you tell me about it and you know she kind of broke down the formula for me like okay so this is what like the how it works this is how the bailey school kids formula works and um you know that's mainly what the content of the conversation was it didn't really necessarily get into explicitly you know this is why i like it but i feel like it was you know in the discussion of the formula that kind of that seemed to be to me the implicit message was that it's the formula that is the draw and kind of the quirkiness of the series that it it is um kind of its playful nature that um you know if you're into you know just uh you know fantastical creatures slash monsters um it's just a fun quirky series to dive into it has a very reassuring formula um as uh eric and i will will probably mention um, <laughs> we're mentioning it now uh but there are like certain lines that get repeated in every book um and they 
like do that thing for instance where a character one of the kids says the title of the book at some point uh and you know like in a bonble snowman don't roast marshmallows doesn't roast marshmallows um it's usually in the sequence that they're kind of piecing these clues together like oh well you know mr uh so-and-so and i totally forgot what the abominable snowman's name is mr smith miller i don't know um you know he he's got like this furry looking suit on and uh he built like an igloo with a complete set of ice you know snow furniture um and they're just like it's usually in the part of the book where they're like adding up all these details and somebody comes to the realization it's like do you think that it's possible that mr or mrs so-and-so could be dot 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 to which somebody almost always replies oh come on abominable snowmen don't roast marshmallows and it's like boom boom all right that's it that's the book we can end it now somebody said the title um so you know it's it but it's all in good fun it's just kind of meant and i would say that it's um it's in some ways it's like not as cheesy <laughs> as like goosebumps could be in its own right even though it has a very defined formula Whereas, you know, uh, a series like Goosebumps where it wasn't recurring characters, uh, book in and book out, it had a little bit more wiggle room to do slightly different things. Um, But even taking that into account, um, I feel like the series isn't necessarily like kind of hokey or, you know, dumb (laughs) for the most part. It's just, you know, it's it's quirky and it's comforting. And I think um, that's probably what draws people to it not to mention just like the fun titles you know kind of like uh we just saw earlier just you know saying these titles is is kind of delightful in its own right and you know dreaming up your own variations on it so i feel like that might be it and one thing that i was sort of trying to track but i don't think i did it successfully was i was trying to see if like it was the same character every time Because, you know, there is always some member of the group who has to be skeptical and somebody Mm -hmm. who's really pushing the narrative of like, no, it's I noticed in in Mrs. Claus doesn't climb telephone poles. It's Liza who's very adamant that Mrs. Mm. That the woman named Joy is actually Mrs. Claus. And then Howie's the one who's like, Mrs. Claus doesn't climb telephone poles. And I I was trying to remember because we both we both also coincidentally read um werewolves don't go to summer camp yeah so i was trying to remember like who is it in that book who thinks he's a werewolf or is it all of them or at various points like i i wasn't sure what the narrative was in terms of like is it always the same characters or do they switch off believing or i think they switch um because now that you like bring up that book i feel like uh how howie liza and melody were in the camp haha of um, Mr. So-and-so, the camp counselor, is a werewolf. He is displaying very werewolf-like behaviors and attributes. And Eddie was like the staunch disbeliever um, who said, oh, werewolves don't go to summer camp, whatever. Um, and I know for sure that he was the one who's, who said that abominable snowmen don't roast marshmallows. But I think it does switch. Um, I mean, that would be... Yeah, Especially in the if you were, yeah, in Abominable Snowman, I think it's Melody who's pushing because she's yeah. the one who like is running around showing them all the tracks in the yard and stuff. Yeah, like I said, she she definitely takes the investigative lead with that one. Um, but yeah, I feel like especially if you were a fan of the series and you were reading, you know, each book, um, you know, it it would have behooved the authors not to switch it up because then you would have really felt like you were reading the exact same damn thing every time if it was the same character disbelieving and the same character, you know, uh, presenting the Hey, evidence. we all so, watched the X-Files for nine years. Oh, that's true Plus. enough, I guess. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think they did switch it up. Okay. Well, to answer your earlier question, um, I 
don't think I would have been into these as a kid. I think because it is just like, it does feel like such a tease. Like mm. if there's a werewolf, make him attack somebody and not just like we hear a wolf howl in the distance. So we see a vague silhouette out amongst the trees, you know, Oh, he's a uh, Mr. Camp counselor guy is itching himself all over because of the wolf bane or whatever, or is it mistletoe? There's something that they put in his water or something to, mistletoe yeah 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 uh so i think i probably would have been frustrated by that but as an adult i think it's one of those things that i can appreciate it more because um Mm -hmm. they're just kind of like hangout books for the most part like there's not really that much of a conflict or like a ticking clock element or anything like that i mean i guess there's a little bit like we got to survive this full moon without getting eaten or something but (laughs) it's never really that urgent yeah, I, I did really like that um that first book that we read, Werewolves Don't Go to Summer Camp. Um, because I mean, I'm just a werewolf guy. Um and I uh, we, we previously talked about I think um just summer camp in general is still to this day, because I, I, I never did it as a kid. It's just this very mystical <laughs> this very mystical thing to me, uh, so I can't help but feel a little you know, a little spark of uh, interest and just intrigue anytime it crops up in a book like this. Like, oh yeah, summer camp with cabins and mess halls and archery and, you know, nature hikes. Wow, what a world. Even though um, I I know I've I said this before. I think it was just in conversation. I don't think we were recording. Um, I did find it... Um, a very amusing and probably more true to life of what summer camp really was like for, for kids who went there. Um, that anytime they mentioned food in that book, werewolves don't go to summer camp. It was always very dismal. Like they talked about the soggy tacos and I, I can't remember any of the other ones, but it was always like <laughs> this, you know, food that was, you know, dry, that was not supposed to be dry and food that was wet, that was not supposed to be wet. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like that is and probably all the closer. meat was like raw, which was a clue. That yeah, this guy was a werewolf. Yeah, uh, that's probably truer to life of the summer camp experience than, you know, this very picturesque view I have of it. Um by dint of, uh, you know, these chapter books for kids that I've read (laughs) my whole life. Um, But uh, yeah, in any case, uh, that was the first book we read in preparation for a Bailey School Kids episode. Uh, But then that kind of fell to the wayside. Huh, wayside. Being another school kid series. Uh Um, Hey, wow, you like that? Yeah, (laughs) talk about segues. Jeez. Totally by accident. Anyhow, um, so like we said, though, we use just this kind of time of the year to uh, hone our focus in on this uh, massive series. So we have these Santa Claus books and the Abominable Snowman, uh, which sounds like a Rankin-Bass special just waiting to happen right there. So the first one we read was... I think it's just called Rudolph. Yeah, it is. It is. It's already um, been made, Jose. <laughs> yeah, it, it has been made. The Bumble doesn't roast marshmallows. What are you talking about? Man, those things, you always have to like download some weird, uh, you know, some weird like crappy little dinky app you've never heard of to watch those Christmas specials because they're not, they're never streaming anywhere. Really? I didn't realize that because I'm a loser that actually has those on DVD because I see them yeah, at Walmart well, we and I'm like, have them on Yay. DVD, Yeah, when I live <laughs> with my parents. But let me look up Rudolph and see. It's going to be some app called like Buddy Brain. <laughs> yeah. Oh, never mind. Okay, you could just buy it on YouTube or whatever. But I feel like, oh, there, well, it, I feel like a couple count. of years ago, it used to be like some app you'd never heard of that you would only download ever to watch these Christmas yeah. specials. I feel like uh, there have been years that I've watched March to the Wooden Soldiers in that exact same manner. It's like, all right, well, let's download this weird ass thing. Just the so uh, can... Abbott and Costello one, or I mean, um, sorry, uh, Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> Is one of them a fat guy and one of them a skinny guy in their yep. comedy team? Yep. 
Abbott and Costello, you got it. Yep, no, that's the one. Laurel and Hardy. That's yeah. Required viewing for me. Every Is that year. the one where there's like a pig that they think has been eaten because there's yep. like sausage links? Yeah, I think that movie disturbed me when I was a kid. Well, it should, because um, you know some of the costume characters are terrifying, and there's that <laughs> there's that great off-brand Mickey Mouse puppet. Uh, I, I have to tell myself that it's a puppet because if I find out that it was somebody inside a costume, my brain just may break. Um, but it's a, it's a puppet that's, uh, playing around with, uh, the, the cat from Hey Diddle Diddle, which is a costume actor, which is terrifying in its own right. Um, because the actor who is in the Hey Diddle Diddle cat costume uh has this habit of um lolling his tongue out frequently because i guess that's the thing he thought cats did <laughs> so just as he's like on a fiddle there he's like <laughs> you know staring dead-eyed into the camera <laughs> <laughs> that sounds way worse than this slappy you have so much of a fear hard on for <laughs> Well, that's hey. I mean, that's the thing, though, is that uh, it's these things that I'm both simultaneously uh, perturbed by, but also intensely fascinated with. Um, but you know, that's just the way my psychology works, I guess. <laughs> so Santa Claus doesn't mop floors, huh? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, enough about. Uh, Enough about cats playing the fiddle. Uh, so Santa Claus doesn't mop floors. Um, this yeah, is... I don't think we necessarily, by the way, need to do like a beat by beat plot. Oh, description definitely or not. Yeah, definitely not for this series. Because there's not much to these books, really. Yeah. Um, but the thumbnail is that um, the uh, janitor at the Bailey Elementary. What, it's a bit, yeah, I think it's just Bailey Elementary. I don't think it's Bailey City Elementary. Bailey Elementary quits right before Christmas because the kids are wrecking the place and just, uh, you know, like smearing peanut butter on the stairs and things like that. Uh, and so they're forced to hire a new janitor. Oh, and... let me oh. let me ask you a question yeah. about that. Because, again, this is uh, reading books for kids kind of makes me realize, <laughs> like, what tropes worked for me. Yep, And then, you know, because I wasn't analyzing that at the time, but looking back at it now, I'm like, I never liked this, but I didn't know enough to say I didn't like it. But um, the idea of like, I really hated like, um, I don't know, like naughty kids or like mischievous kids or like uh, kids who are just like ruining everything. Like in this, this book starts out really hard with like these uh, Eddie... Um, roping Howie into like what was it they put smeared peanut butter all over what was it this this like the stairs the banister I think oh right right yeah and it, it just kind of I don't know it just made me think of all the kids movies I saw where kids were like just doing the most nasty things but mm -hmm. it's a movie for kids so you're I think you're supposed to be like hooray ha 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 there's <laughs> I was always just like no just don't do that you jerk yeah, uh, was that a trope that you responded to, or I? I think I probably had the same reactions to it um, that you did. Although I, I, that was like my. I guess you would say that that was like maybe my internal reaction to it, but I still kind of swallowed it hook, line, and sinker because, as we saw uh, two episodes ago with Evil Mirror. Those were just things I thought kids, you know, like if you were writing about kids, you wrote about them having firecracker wars. Because uh, to be honest, though, between the two, like pulling pranks of, you know, the type, oh, I'm going to smear peanut butter on the stairs at school and having a firecracker war. I think mine is much more uh, realistic and probable to happen you know, just the whole idea of kids pulling pranks, though, I mm. feel like is, um, I don't know. I feel like it's, I would say outdated, but I, I can't help but wonder, like, was that ever a thing? Was that ever a thing to even call it outdated? Um, 
you know, because right. like, yeah, like, like it conjures images of like comic book ads to me of like chattery teeth and, you know, <laughs> fake out glasses and th- like, I, f- I feel like it's of an earlier era of um at, or or is it just that, you know, adults always presume this about kids that, you know, they're just natural born pranksters and practical jokers and you know they 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 would eat this stuff up or you know was was there maybe a time in history where um kids had a bit more of a proclivity to do that kind of thing i don't know um but yeah as as a modern day person you know in in the here and now you know a person who works with kids now um and who in the same for when i was a kid myself in the 90s that that thing even though I would just swallow it as part of the narrative, like, yeah, sure, let's just get on to the monsters. I feel like it, it rang false for me, too. It's like, I just can't, I can't imagine doing that myself. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I don't recall things that were like, like, I know kids get into trouble, but mm-hmm. I don't remember things that were like premeditated, like right. bring a jar of peanut butter to school for the express purpose of rubbing it all up and down the banister to make this guy go crazy. Yeah. We're just not that organized as kids. Um, we're just not. Yeah. Um, so I was um, going to say something yeah, else, but I forgot. So anyway, okay. anyway, so yeah, that's, that's why what the to... janitor leaves. Yep. That's why the janitor leaves. And that's why, that's how we get Mr. Jolly who spoiler alert looks like, sounds like, acts like Santa Claus and some of the characters are convinced that is who he is, and some of them are not. Spoiler alert again, the people who are not are named Eddie. <laughs> um, I will say with this particular book... Eddie's a bit of a Scrooge, yeah. just because his mom's dead. Can you Ugh. believe? What a and wet blanket. Which... <laughs> and this is just kind of registering with me now in light of what you said to me earlier about, well... We wanted to keep the fact that Mrs. Jeepers might have been a vampire ambiguous because we didn't want to scare the kids. Oh, by the way, Eddie's mom is dead. I know, right? <laughs> and I she's was like not kind of coming back. <laughs> I was jarred out of the book kind of because I was like, man, a book for kids it, this young acknowledges death. Yeah, I mean, we we didn't even get that. You know, R.L. Stein never even broached anything like that. <laughs> Um, that, you know, there yeah, was, and it's not like she's going to come back as Visser one or anything. Yeah. So Animorphs reference. Ooh, there you go. Fans. You got it. You've been waiting for it. People have yeah, been that... begging for me to drop in more Animorphs <laughs> references. We call that an Easter egg. No, we don't. I think an Easter egg is hidden in some way. Anyway, go on Jose. Well, whether they're hidden or not, ogres don't hunt for them. That I can tell you. Uh, you're right. But anywho, um, yeah, no, the, the, I had the same reaction. That was like, whoa, what? <laughs> it's, it's not just like that his parents are divorced. It's like, no, Eddie's mom is dead and he's not been the same since. And this is book number three. <laughs> so this is like, you know, oh, the lovable prankster, um, you know, slash mischievous imp uh of our cast it's like oh well you see the reason he's probably like this is that um he uh you know his mother died and uh he doesn't see his dad a lot because he's always working it's like jesus bailey school kids i did not expect to be traipsing down this path in the christmas book of all things but here we are um having said that though I did like how um, the uh, the whole weirdness of, uh, you know, this particular, um, the introduction of the fantastical element was uh, tied to one of the characters specifically. Like, it just wasn't an incidental thing that happened in the background. Um, like, oh boy, that's kind of weird, huh? Who's this stranger? All right, well, I guess we'll try to figure it out, and we probably won't, and then that's just the end of it. I did like that, um, you know, Mr. Jolly's appearance and presence in the book was uh, intrinsically tied to, you know, Eddie's mini journey um, throughout the course of, of the book. I thought that was neat. 
What about you? I don't know that I really thought about it that much, but now that you mention oh. it, yes. Well. It is nice for these kids to have a character arc of some kind. Well, it may just be um, my my particular fondness for the Santa Claus archetype. Uh, so anytime, you know, it's it's uh, it's a fixture and kind of a sweet emotional story like this. I guess I tend to pick up on it perhaps quicker than others do. And by others, I mean people named Eric. Mm, I feel mm. bad for that that idiot. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, but no, I, I thought it was a pretty sweet story. I, I'm sure that you were a big fan of um, the the part where Eddie vomited all over Santa's colorful tennis shoes, because I know you're such oh, yeah. a fan of gross out moments. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess it's better to read about than to see in a movie or something. True enough. I got to admit something to you, and this is... Um, what's sounding like a, a, a way in which our personalities do differ. I, I don't know. I'm a little ashamed to admit it, but I have an, uh, an Achilles heel when it comes to um, people vomiting <laughs> in movies and that uh, no matter how dumb it is, I always find it funny. I just, I oh, it always gets a laugh out of me. And I, I think it's just the involuntary nature of it. <laughs> <laughs> paired with um the sound i don't know uh you know i tend to i tend to shy away from most brands or uh iterations of sophomoric humor you know sophomoric comedy but man there's just something about somebody like especially if it's like a real spontaneous out of nowhere like you know somebody's talking and then <laughs> you know off to the side it just gets me every time <laughs> part of me is really ashamed of that but you know i'm trying to i'm just trying to embrace it so that is my admission to you for this episode yeah i mean i would agree with that um i guess i don't know that i put vomiting in the same gross out category as mm. like you know Oh, boogers. Oh, you sure. You know, like somebody yeah. getting snot all over everything or whatever. Yeah. Um, it feels different. Maybe because there's something that seems a little bit more contrived about some of the mm. other, uh, you know, like garbage pail kids type humor or something. Um, sure. Like you really got to go fishing for that stuff. Whereas like vomiting, that's a thing that happens. And it is a very uh, yeah, and that... vulnerable moment. So. <laughs> yeah maybe it's that too the vulnerability so it's it's Let less about the uh, the grossness of it i think and more about the um like it is an embarrassing situation to find yourself in yeah like the context uh well i was gonna say let me ask you this um slight tangent into another arena of a uh, juvenile literature were you a captain underpants reader at all no i think that was after my time Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Are you a fan of Captain Underpants? I was. I was definitely. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I guess I just had, uh, to a certain degree, I still do. Um, I, I find, um, I find narratives where people make up superhero characters or it's you know uh, we just watched this movie the other day it's it's uh kind of like a one off thing like jingle all the way with turbo man i don't know there's just something about like one off superheroes or narratives where people are making up their own superheroes that i just find endearing um that's it, funny it's because kinda... i'm going to uh i had a little note about um mrs claus doesn't climb, climb telephone poles about how i love uh, holiday stories where they have to make up a toy to be like the hot new toy that they can't keep <laughs> on the shelves. And yeah. it is always something like Jingle All the Way, Turbo Man, or something like stupid like that that I think is really fun. Well, uh, and yeah, I, I, I guess it's similar um, to what I said in the Goosebumps episode where uh, when we were talking about Shocker and Shock Street, like I just, I, I like, you know, hearing somebody's made up theme park and just seeing what they do with that. I don't know. It's just, you know, part of it is like, um, 
you know, kind of stirs my own creativity a bit and it kind of gets me, you know, dreaming up things. Um, but I, I like that it, it's almost kind of like a, it's almost comforting in a way because it's like this micro universe where like this one thing exists, like in Jingle All The Way, it's like that's the toy and it exists as its own thing. You know, you don't really see anything or hear anything about like Tickle Me Elmo or, you know, or He-Man or like or Furby or like any of these other toys that might have been popular. It's like, no, this is just the universe that we've created. And in this universe, the theme park is, you know, Shock Street, the or Horrorland, the toy is Turbo Man. Um, the superhero is Captain Underpants. Like, that's that's the guy. I, I, I don't know. There's just something kind of warm and fuzzy about it, I guess, in a way. Mm. Which I guess, that's that's what it seems to be more and more that I talk about these things. That's what it boils down to me across the board these days. I'm always talking about warm and fuzzy and cozy stuff. It's like, if it makes me feel that, then I will like it. <laughs> very good yeah. yeah we just watched a a frazier um holiday episode and i think i might be misremembering i think the toy that his son wants is called like laser man or something generic like that <laughs> and i'll just go ahead and say because i really don't have that much to say about mrs claus doesn't climb telephone poles so i'll go ahead and say that in that um book the hot new toy is Bug squashers from Planet Zerlot. That's the thing that Eddie wants. Wow. And they like shoot lasers out of their eyes. You know, he's like enthusiastically. They always shoot lasers out of their eyes. Uh, <laughs> that's like the enthusiastic, like, yeah. It, which, you know, in real life, you get a toy that shoots lasers and it's just like a little laser pointer type thing. And you're like, well, done playing with that after three seconds. Yep. <laughs> But it's always yeah. sold as like the coolest thing you could get on Buzz Lightyear or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, not a flying toy. Um, yeah. Oh, and the rest of the note that I wrote was um, there. Whenever they make up these toys for these uh, movies or stories, they're always very like boy centric action figure toys, mm. which is funny because in real life, all of the toy crazes that I remember from the 90s were like Tickle Me Elmo. Beanie Babies, Teletubbies, Furbies, like very what you would think of as like a girl toy or something. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. Thank you for saying so. I don't know if it actually is, but. I, I thought it was. I genuinely thought <laughs> it was. Um, yeah, I was just going to make a comment earlier. You said, what was the name of the toy again? From Mrs. Claus Doesn't Climb Telephone Poles? Yeah. Bug Squashers from Planet Zerlot. Zerlot. Man, I, I just feel like that name could have uh, cropped up easily. And I forgot what the episode proper was, but whatever one we were talking about, rip off TMNT right. <laughs> franchises, it's like, oh, there's another one for that for that pile. Bug squashers from Planet Zerlot. <laughs> right. Or Pizza like eating the... samurai cats, whatever. <laughs> but ugly Martian category. <laughs> Uh, so, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't read, uh, Mrs. Claus doesn't climb telephone poles. Did that have a similar narrative track as, uh, Santa Claus doesn't mop floors where somebody, what, you know, was, uh, going between being a believer or a non-believer? Like, was it, was there any of that business going on? Um, well, they do mention at one point. It might have been Eddie. I don't know. Some somebody saying like, "Well, we never proved that SC was Santa Claus," because mm -hmm. they bring him up. Because um, the whole story of the book is that this woman named Joy is like they overhear her talking to you know Eli the Elf about like, "I'm never coming back to the North Pole. He doesn't appreciate me," and all <laughs> oh, <wow>. that stuff. <laughs> uh, so yeah, she's discontent with their their marriage life. Like he's always. <laughs> Uh, he's so focused on all this toy stuff. He doesn't have any time for me. Um, and then at the end, uh, two of the kids like have a fight and then they're like, wait, just because we have a fight doesn't mean we shouldn't stay friends and patch things over. And Mrs. Claus is like, 
yeah, I'm inspired to go patch things up with my husband. And then she disappears. Wow. So I don't, I don't recall there being any, um, you know, polar express, like, do I still hear the <laughs> bell ringing type stuff? Yeah. I'll go ahead and uh, say the other notes that I have for Mrs. Claus. Cause I, sure. again, I don't have that much to say about it. Um, it mentions the internet cause the internet is down because of a snowstorm at the beginning of the book. Mm. That was a little jarring for me after reading <laughs> books number like two and three in the series, Yeah, which came out in like the early nineties. I was like the internet, what are they talking about? Uh, they have a reference to sleds having model numbers. There's the QT 10 mm. and the LB 56. And I was like, that feels like a very 90s or early 2000s joke where I feel like I remember, like Calvin and Hobbes for sure did that. Um, and I was like, did sleds in real life actually have numbers or was it just like a plastic sled is what I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recall there being like models of sled that you could buy. Those sound like chat room usernames to me. Oh, hi, QT. It's LB again. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, oh, and then there's a point where I think it's Liza over here is something that seems to confirm they're in the burger doodle, which I do not like as a name for it, but that's like their restaurant no. hangout spot. Yeah. I don't, I don't like, like that. that at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Liza over here is Mrs. Claus say something that seems to confirm that she is in fact, Mrs. Claus and she screams out loud and the other customers, their reaction is quote, the other customers looked at the kids for a full 13 seconds. <laughs> and I wrote down, that's a real Jose Cruz type of sentence. <laughs> and that's it. That's all the notes I have about Mrs. Claus doesn't climb telephone poles. Wow. Seems like they took a page from the evil mirror diary <laughs> with that specificity with numbers. 13 <laughs> seconds. Wow. That gives me yeah. a run for my money. I know. <laughs> Always oh thinking goodness. about you and your firecracker embedding in newspaper ways. <laughs> oh, I did that while Eric was drinking. I hope that I got a good sputter out of him. Anyhow, uh, so yeah, that's Santa Claus. <laughs> oh, are you the Hey Diddle Diddle Cat? <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's all making sense now. Uh, so that's the Santa Claus books. What about the Abominable Snowman? Uh, what do we have to say about that? I was a little underwhelmed by that one. Um, it Ooh. felt like it had a lot of bumbling kid action and not enough, yes, not, not even not even remotely enough of a monster presence. To uh, yeah, that was the first one where I was getting annoyed with the kids. Because I was like, yeah. there's nothing there, you guys. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> yeah, like the like the whole like literally the whole I mean, I mean at least with um you know Santa Claus doesn't mop floors, their conflict was that um something we didn't mention was that uh so not only do they get this new janitor, but every time like Eddie tries to s stir some crap up and like trash the school, he like toilet tea like TPs the staff lounge. Um, you know, and he tells how he, Hey, go check out what I did in the teacher's lounge and how he comes back. He's like, what are you talking about? It's, it's perfectly clean in there. Whoops. Look at that. The, the whole place is pristine. So oh, is it Mr. Jolly? Does he have some magical tricks up his sleeve uh, that allow him to, you know, clean in such a way? Um, so it's like an actual exchange, uh, as far as the conflict is concerned. Um, but here it's like, we met this big weird guy in the snow who liked marshmallows. And then we went home and everything that happens after that is like the kids convincing themselves that strange stuff is happening or that potentially dangerous stuff is going to happen. And, you know, the abominable snowman figure does not figure into that at all it's just them making stuff up basically and trying to figure out ways to solve those problems that they have just made up <laughs> so it's like oh yeah. boy yeah it's clearly the end of the series we're just running out of ways <laughs> to put these kids through the ringer and you know like have an actual conflict develop 
Yeah, I said earlier that like we don't need to do a beat by beat because these books have no plot, but this is the one that really has no plot. There is literally nothing there. And I'm curious about word count too, because mm. the, I noticed the the earlier books that I read um, just have like, you know, a, an illustration every four or five or six pages or whatever. But then these later books in the series, it's like every other page is an illustration. So I was like, are they using the illustrations to really pad this out to get it up to their 80 page? Because, yeah, it just felt like there was nothing to this last The Abominable Snowman one. Yeah, it's like the well is running dry. And I mean, that's not, um, you know, a criticism against like, oh, you they just weren't creative enough. I mean, this is this is like a very taxing series to have taken on and to have done so many books for where you're following the same kids. Basically going through more or less the exact same experience with each entry. And, you know, this is. One reason, and I know like modern day books, I, I don't think there's any series like this, um, any modern series that's like this that has so many volumes. You know, this Bailey School Kids is a good um, is a good one to hold up as being a, a shining example of what we've talked about in previous episodes. I was just picking. Yep, there it is. Um, of what I heard referred to in an article as the scholastic publishing complex, industrial complex, the the scholastic publishing industrial complex, where they were just churning out so many books in the, you know, mid to late eighties and the night and throughout the nineties, you know, all the series that, you know, the names of goosebumps, sweet Valley high Bailey school kids, animorphs. They just kept churning them out um, and with this particular series, you know, Animorphs is one thing where it's like, okay, well, there's like, it's it's basically a battle, you know, this war that's being waged between these two. Um, yeah, it's life, serialized life to some extent. Yeah, so it's like, you know, there's a there's give and take um, amongst the entries, but with this one, it's like, uh, <laughs> where where can you go? You're just you're just repeating the same thing time and again. And again, that um, that works, I think, to an extent for the audience that they were writing for. You know, clearly it left a legacy that uh, a lot of people remember the series by and, and remember fondly. Usually, I don't think I've ever seen anybody like complain about the series. Um, you know, it certainly left its mark on folks like my wife that have these um, these fond memories of it, where it was just kind of like a source for comfort. You, you know, you, you, you really weren't like you've have been saying this whole time at that age, you're not really evaluating it critically. You know, you're just reading just to read for the enjoyment of it. Um, and so that's fine for you as the reader, but from the standpoint of the writer, I mean, I feel like you really put yourself in a corner and then I'm not saying they brought this on themselves. It's just like, Hey, this, the series is popular. Let's keep doing it. Um, you really put yourself in a corner cause it's like, what, else can we possibly have these kids go through that they haven't gone through before um so you know you you end up with entries like the abominable snowman doesn't roast marshmallows it's like well actually yes he does but he doesn't do much else (laughs) anything of note in the in the actual story yeah and this one had like a sequence at the end i know you're saying like (laughs) we don't mean to be cruel to these authors um, but I will say like, guys, maybe you need to get your fax machines cleaned or something. Cause there's like a sequence at the end. There's like a 10 minute, like, uh, slapstick sequence. Basically. Yeah. It felt like I was watching like inspector gadget, like the movie or something. Yes. <laughs> it was just like, Whoa, Whoa. Where they're chasing after, uh, the guy he's like skiing down the mountain, I guess. Yeah, are they the, on a mountain? But somehow they, they no, got they were, to the they top were of on this, a mountain. Yeah, but they had their sled, so they're like chasing after him in the sled. I think, and uh-huh. they're just like whoa, whoa, like jumping over. It, it like ends with them like uh, sailing through the air off of. Mm-hmm. I think it just says like a ramp with no explanation of <laughs> how. It, why is there a ramp there? And then they land on the float of the winter parade. 
And it turns out that it's like, oh, all this stuff that we saw that we thought was made of ice is actually constructed of uh, mega marshmallows because he's a, a sales representative for mega marshmallow. <laughs> <laughs> and then they plow into it like face first. And then yeah. everybody in the, in the, <laughs> Everybody watching the parade is like, hooray, what a great finish to that race. Yeah, that just put me in mind of the, the Battle of the Bands from my hairiest adventure. Like, wow, what great special effects. <laughs> yeah, it's right. Like, Why do you keep doing this to us, Scholastic? <laughs> it gives you this idea that like... I don't know that like you could just like screw up anything colossally in front of a crowd <laughs> yeah. and they'll all just be like so generous, like, oh, hey, that was pretty amazing. Especially if you're kids, which is yeah. completely antithetical to how <laughs> it would happen in real life. They're like, oh, my God, what are these little bastards up to? They just ruined everything. It's how it would happen in real life. But in the books, it's like, wow, look at these little whippersnappers. Aren't they just the bee's knees? <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh this um this meme it's not really a meme though it's an actual sequence from a movie um that's just been memefied um this this whole thing that we're talking about uh makes me kind of desperately wish for uh within the context of like the book that is happening in like if say like these you know our four heroes crashed into the mega marshmallow float and they were like haha you know, like, cheese, we did it. Um, just one of the adults having the reaction of the, the moderator from the uh, the test, or whatever it is, the quiz at the end of um, Billy Madison. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. Like, that's the reaction that I would have loved to have seen from an adult character. So let me ask you this, Jose. Talking about mm -hmm. the episodic nature of these books, would you prefer your favorite story <laughs> structure of series nowadays if you had the the books where they're introducing all the various monsters and it all builds up to an epic battle of good and evil. All right. Like Frankenstein so... versus the sea bitch or whatever. <laughs> like all the, like Avengers infinity war or end game where it's like the both sides are just like, or I guess it would be more like civil war. <laughs> yeah. Like all the, all the monsters, you know, werewolves are, clamping down on santa claus's throat and all that stuff <laughs> um that would be kind of cool if for no other reason just to see that image and others like it um oh god but honestly though that would be such a i mean if it was the length that this series was you know 50 you know books in the og series and 80 total um oh my god that would be such a headache <laughs> to keep track of um no, I think I think um the episodic nature that they were originally um created in is the most fitting format for for these stories to come in just because um you know, I guess I would liken it to maybe like Kolchak the Night Stalker TV series <laughs> which is funny in its own right. Um, because, you know, there it's it was like a series made for adults starring adult characters. Um, I, you know, it's really humorous there because this guy is encountering monsters all the time in the same city and nobody will believe him, <laughs> you know, week in and week out, even though it's like, oh, my God, how, how many times does this happen, happen to have how many times does this have to happen to me? I mean, I guess it's the same idea as X-Files, but there there's like more of a sense of intrigue, you know, like, is it, you know, w will the truth get out there or won't it? But with, you know, Kolchak, the Night Stalker, it's kind of like Bailey's school kids where it's like people just forget. <laughs> we don't, we don't mention, you know, the Moss Monster 
that was seen in the last episode. Like, not even incidentally. It's like, no, <laughs> we're just going to move on. Um, you know, so it makes me think of Billy School Kids in that sense. It's like, no, no, we're, we're just going to move on. We're, we're going to forget about the sea bitch <laughs> and, <laughs> and just move on to the next thing. Uh, so. Or like my my favorite uh, Christmas movie of all time, mm. Die Hard. <laughs> oh, mm. um, in Die Hard Two, which also takes place on Christmas, they have they have John McClane incredulously say, um, "How can the exact same thing happen to the exact same guy two Christmases in a row?" <laughs> to kind of like lampshade their lazy screenwriting. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, they have the reporter guy from the first movie just happens to be on a plane with John McClane's wife. And then, like, Al from the first movie just happens to show up at the airport for, like, a different flight or something. Like, oh, hey, Al, what are you doing here of all places? Wow. Well, thankfully, that doesn't happen either. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't, in the few books we read, I don't, I don't remember... I'm sure the kids must have been incredulous at some point. Like, why do we, why, why do we keep meeting these weird adults? <laughs> why does it keep happening? Yeah, that's like the best case scenario is they're just really weird and usually kind of mean adults. Oh, that was yeah. another thing. I didn't, uh, that's another thing that I wrote down in Santa Claus doesn't mop floors. Cause reading that after the werewolf book, I was like, I feel like, part of the fantasy of having monsters come through your town would be like, especially somebody like Santa Claus is like, you should forge some kind of like special relationship or something like miracle on 34th street or whatever. Hmm. But the adults are all like kind of weird and mean and like neglectful. And <laughs> they're not very uh, nice to these kids at all. <laughs> like Santa Claus just keeps turning the heat down. So all the kids are like freezing to death in their classroom. Because he's like, I prefer it cold. <laughs> this is what I like. Shut up, <laughs> Billy. <laughs> and the abominable snowman guy just keeps like roaring at these kids at the top of his lungs. And they're like, yeah. they're just like terrified of all these adult figures that have like, huh. It feels like that's kind of undercutting the fun that was promised on the covers where it seems like they're going to be like buddies with this monster. <laughs> I could see like a, uh, uh, and I'm sure um, somebody has done some uh some photoshops of these books whether it's been you know like paperback paradise or outright in the childhood <laughs> but you know i could totally like see the vampire from the cover of uh vampires don't sip lemonade or whatever it is because the kids are like peeking around the corner of a doorway and the vampire's just lounging in the chair sipping on his drink i, I could totally see somebody like photoshopping the uh, tagline of the book to read fuck off kid <laughs> Because he's giving that vibe. <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. And actual artwork. It's like, just get out of here. <laughs> They're yeah. giving off uh, Uncle Frank vibes, all the adults. <laughs> get yeah, out of here, you much. little pervert. <laughs> <laughs> get out of here, you nosy little pervert, or I'm going to slap you silly. <laughs> Those are all the adults in Bailey City. <laughs> <laughs> in yeah, the <exactly>. thumbnail <laughs> well well yeah that's it that's it folks that's yeah the, the daily end. school kids if you were expecting a discussion um that was maybe a little more enamored in tone um sorry we, well, we did, didn't read these I, ones uh, as kids <laughs> yeah i i don't want to end on a sour note because i did actually enjoy <laughs> these books for the most part I think I was just more Same. surprised at, you know, that they didn't quite wind up being what I expected them to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I like, like I said um, earlier when I was recounting my wife's, uh, you know, breakdown on the formula and whatnot, I think there is um, a lot of comfort to be derived from these, especially if, um, you know, you're a kid encountering them for the first time or you're an adult revisiting them as my wife has, um, and then just, you, you know, uh, reveling in, in the in the simple rules of this universe that, you know, here are these four kids who routinely meet an, an eccentric adult and who kind of uh, take the reins and try to investigate and solve the mystery themselves, uh, only to find out that, well, quote unquote, find out 
that uh well maybe they're just kind of you know an eccentric adult and and not some kind of fearsome creature of lore um you know there's there's a lot of fun and pleasure and comfort to be derived from that and and it did come through i'd say especially um in the first two books i read werewolves don't go to summer camp and santa claus doesn't mop floors um i felt those keenly in uh, the earlier entries as opposed to the slightly dry <laughs> on a on a imagination a bottomless snowman doesn't roast marshmallows yeah and the mrs claus one i think they that one probably gets closest to uh where they actually form some kind of relationship with joy cuz like at one point they're they're out sledding and eddie accidentally sl- um sends his sled down a hill without being on it and it crashes into a maybe a telephone pole, the <laughs> titular telephone pole. And it like bursts into a bunch of pieces and he's all sad about it. And then Mrs. Claus comes over and like magically fixes it with a hammer and nails and stuff. So I was like, Oh, that's kind of a sweet moment. That's kind of, it, it's just that I think I was expecting a little bit more of that, like, you know, not being uh, terrified or disgusted by these adults all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, an interesting tight wire act these books uh these books walk. Uh but if uh you are somebody who really enjoyed this series as a kid or if you have um specific memories related to different books from the series, if you think that maybe we missed the boat on um the true genius or uh beauty of of this series because we didn't read the right entries, uh reach out and let us know. You can always email us at our email address, blackmagictreehousepod at gmail.com. Um, and that's also our handle on Instagram, blackmagictreehousepod. Uh, but let us know which of the entries that you remember, that you enjoyed, um, and of course, any other creepy, weird, strange, terrifying books that uh, you read as a kid that maybe you'd like to see on the show. Um we're always, always in the market for that kind of stuff. Did you have anything to say, Eric? Well, I was going to ask you, uh, it would be a funny punchline to end on if we both came up with oh. a, a Bailey oh. School Kids title. That might be a fun signing off to do. Maybe not every episode, but it's like, hey, do you got one today? Uh, okay. <laughs> um how do we want to do this? Do you have one? Do you want to go first? I thought of one that made me laugh because I was picturing the cover while you were talking. Oh, uh, great. S- Slender Man doesn't have an Etsy shop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. Okay. Okay. I'm just picturing on the cover like some gaunt, sickly, tall guy, like sitting at a computer, like <laughs> type with his little crafts that he makes surrounding him, yeah. like taking pictures. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, weird. Um, Momo doesn't do unboxing videos. <laughs> <laughs> and that's our show. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Love you. Goodbye. Love from Slenderman and Momo. Merry Christmas, you filthy animal. And a Happy New Year.